Howdy, folks. I'm Jeff Gonzalez, former Navy SEAL, founder of Trident Concepts and host of the Bulletproof Workshop powered by AR15.com, where we discuss knowledge, skills and ability to help bulletproof your everyday performance in whatever your field or passion. Welcome to Podcast 031. My next guest cut his teeth as a radio personality on a legendary alternative rock station, K-Rock, in Los Angeles. So spending time in California, I am very familiar with that station because yeah. we that was like the only good station down south for us. Back when people used to actually listen to rock yes, music. Yes, yeah, definitely. Exactly. Oh, I loved it, man. So this is really fun. He's a singer, songwriter, and celebrity impersonator, all with immaculate hair. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> He's been the host or co-host of too many talk shows and radio shows to list, talking about addiction, substance abuse, nutrition, fitness, just to name a few. He's been memorialized with an animated series of his radio personality, Rudy, a stereotypical heavy accented cholo ex-con with a penchant for marijuana and manscaping. Yeah. That one's going to be good. I can't wait to talk about that. He's currently the host of Mikey Likes You, a straightforward podcast on wellness and well-being. He's a California coachman, promenade, protege, vivacious vocalist, dramatic deputy, and sober sermon preacher. Please welcome to the show, Michael Catherwood. All right. <laughs> All right. Round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, Thank man. you for having me. I really, really do appreciate it, too, man. Well, this is going to be fun because, um, you know, your, your experience with everything that you've done, there's so many interesting tangents to talk about. I mean, I'm really curious. I like to start off first because I'm getting ahead of myself with asking the guests where they hail from, where did they grow up, what was their hometown. And before I let you answer that question, mm -hmm. we're going to take a short break for our sponsors. Folks, this show is sponsored by 1776 Insurance. We're talking about comprehensive firearms collection coverage. That also includes your accessories as well as knives. If you've got questions or you want to learn more, please visit 1776insurance.com. And we're back. So where'd you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles, California. No shit. Yeah, really like Pasadena because it's a, you know, say LA. That's that's actually really strange because the city of Los Angeles is like a teeny little yeah. thing downtown. But yeah. yeah, I grew up, I was, you know, right. I'm an East Sider by Dodger Stadium. I, grew up, <laughs> yeah. I like how you claim that. That's awesome. So growing up, what about what time period? What time uh, we're... I was born in the seven. I was born in 1979, so I mean, I was I was like an 80s kid, but nice. I really grew. I grew up in the 90s, you know, like that's when I was in kind of very impressionable. Fell in love with chicks, and <laughs> you know, started getting into trouble, starting to figure out like what is a good thing for me, bad thing for me, and so on. Interesting. So, yeah. and you know, what a lot of people don't realize is like growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in California was actually an amazing experience. Absolutely. We had yeah. so, we've had a lot of guests that kind of have come from that time period. And, and, you know, just, it's, it's interesting to hear that it's, it's, you know, a little sad to see kind of like what has happened to the state since then, but still the fact that it had such a, an amazing impression on so many people is awesome. It, it is. And I, I'm not saying I, I'm not one of those people who like moved to Texas from LA or New York that is going to bemoan where I came from because I still have a serious kind of love affair and connection with uh -huh. the city of Los Angeles. And I think it's really misunderstood because a lot of the negative feelings people have for LA is really just Hollywood. <laughs> Very true. You know, there's 14 million people in the greater Los Angeles area and only like a thousand of them are kind of behaving in the way that gives so the people, true. you know, like the city of LA, the state of California is farmers. Yeah. With high, lightly punctuated with, Cops and yeah, truck yeah, drivers yeah, and, yeah. and blue it's a blue collar place. So true. It's just that, you know, the tech industry in Northern California and Hollywood in, in Southern California absorbs so much interest and so and they create so much money. Yeah. That it kind of just gives these people the impression that, you know, but the reality is like L.A. is actually like a really blue collar place. There's a reason why all those going back to the 40s, all the like film noir and the yeah. old Raymond Chandler novels and all and all now like the Michael Mann movies. There's a reason they take place. In L.A., it's because like the underbelly of the city yeah. is actually where there there's kind of character. Yeah, you know, I always said like New York City, Chicago. Love I love all the kind of major American cities, but these are those are action movies. Yeah. Those are action stars where you know what you're going to see, and it's stunning and it's overwhelming. Yeah, L.A. is really like a film noir in that you go there and you're like, well, I'm going to see Disneyland. Yeah. And I'm going to see, but. 
really what makes it special is all in the shadows. It's, it's so true. It exists. Mm. And the, here's another great little trivia point that not a lot of people know, but California per capital actually has more gun owners than Texas or Florida. Well, it's, 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 it's really, it's like, to you your know, point, like earth. Of, yeah. People like to think of earth, right? Yeah. The reality is earth is ocean. Yeah. Like that's lightly, true. <laughs> just little a few little of, dots okay. here and there. And California, if you really take the time, like drive through California, yeah. it's, it's agriculture. It's yeah, farmland so true, that has these two juggernaut places just stamped into it. Yeah, you know? it's so true. When like I only spent about three and a half years in the state and luckily I was all the way down in San Diego. And it was such a, you know, like in, uh, what I always appreciate about it is like in 15 minutes, I can change scenery. I can go yeah. from the ocean view to the mountain view to the desert view and back to you know the metro view mm -hmm. all in about 15 20 minutes maybe back then traffic wasn't nearly as bad traffic's a little bit more now so maybe it takes you 30 minutes to get to those places but man it was just such a great like the quality of life that we had there was was unique and it was a yeah. special time for us and i just don't think it's it's tenable anymore but not because of the people of, I, I think like the government and then the people who have enough money or power to kind of be in with the the government, the collusion there. Mm. It's a, they're just, they've kind of set that state adrift. Man, it's so know? true. And I mean, hopefully you, you see some nice changes happening. You just hope that they are not too late. Yeah. That's the only thing that you hope for. All right. So you grew up, um, you know, basically eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. Was there something in your childhood that kind of like puts you on this path that you're currently on right now as a personality celebrity? I, there was there essentially my entire childhood put me on my path to do what I was yeah. doing now, but I didn't know it really. And I didn't have any like epiphany really till I was probably like 23, wow. 24 in the sense that like I was, I was, I was, a, I was a loser. I was the kid that sat in the back of the class and I put all my effort and all my focus into being the class clown. Nice. I was that kid. I was yeah. never like a bully. I was never a bat. I was never like the cops didn't know me by name yeah. or anything. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, but I definitely was really motivated to be like just kind of a cut up. Uh -huh. you know, I never had any aspirations to get good grades. I was a good athlete, but I wasn't like going to go play college football or anything. Yeah. I, but I, I liked it. You know, I was yeah. kind of a jock guy. Yeah. But um, I just always assumed uh, at a very young age, no matter what my parents were trying to influence me to do or what people around me were saying, like, I was like, I'm going to swing hammers. I'm going to turn wrenches for a living. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And people can go fuck themselves if they have a problem with that. For sure. Or if, if in, in, in a, in a crate, if everything goes really well for me, I'll be a fireman, you know, like nice. that, that's what, that's my, what my life holds for me, you know? Okay. Um, but then I, I was like, probably six, 16 your sophomore year where I almost got I, I got I guess I got a bit resentful and bitter mm -hmm. because back then I was probably the last era of the kid where they were like if you just don't bother the mm -hmm. kids that are trying hard we'll give you a C just sit in the back. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I gotcha. like nowadays there's, there's criteria where you have to <laughs> teach kids. Yeah. I was like the last era of the kids was like, listen, don't screw with them. Leave I got us, you now. We'll give you a seat. You'd, and I, I never did it. homework. And I, and I actually got like really resentful. So then I thought to myself, were you resentful because you were upset that they were telling you to do something you didn't want to do or were you resentful because they didn't force you to do what you should have done? I, I think there was a, there was a sense. It's like, well, I, what, because I have, because I, I, like I said, and I, I meant, I mean this, I was never a kid that wanted not only not to harm anybody else, but I never wanted to even get in the way of other kids. I wasn't mm. like trying to screw with people. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was so funny when I would like, hole punch like the teacher's roll list you know mm. like and i would come and i would hole punch the whole thing so you just open it like i would fall on the floor and make my whole day with me you know so i <laughs> and nice that's a good one i mean i was I, that that really i would sit up all night thinking of like how i could i could bust balls i loved to bust ball but i never wanted to get and so there was a sense at a young age and i guess i, I wasn't certainly i wasn't mature enough to understand these feelings and or to deal with them properly. 
but it was like, well, I, well I'm not good enough because uh-huh. because I don't want to be an attorney or an accountant or a doctor. Uh, I just shouldn't do stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I, I, I could probably be a good writer. I could yeah. probably be a good art, yeah. physical artist or, or a musician. And so, so then I, I, I made it, I got really kind of, obsessive about like making a living or, or, or cutting out on my own yeah. in a very independent way in some type of expressive art. Yeah. Right? And I like, I, I started to act out, you know, even uh, more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. And again, never anything really bad, but just like, uh, I would just not come home. My parents would be like, well, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like Kerouac. I just finding myself. I was, you know, I was out in the slum in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Discovery and, mode. And I graduated. I wanted to. I wanted to go travel, and I really did. And I went to Europe with nothing, like a backpack, and no shit. Yeah, and um, and so I, I had this idea that I was going to be this kind of like bon vivant, this this like bohemian guy. Um, but I really think that it it developed from my bitterness towards kind of the the, the normal yeah. system, yeah, in the sense that it didn't it didn't include me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, I'm not. Good enough. I'm not a bad kid. I'm not. Yeah. I've never sp- vandalized anything. I never yeah. bullied other kids. Yeah. I just like to. And I'm not very good at physics. I'll be very honest with you, right? Or like, I'm not very good at. Yeah. Uh, I was like, but I could. I, I could write an essay. I could be on the debate team. If yeah, you, yeah. But they were like, no, you go over. Just stay away. Wow, you know, like. Oh, that's. And so I, I got that sense. You know? <sighs> well, <clears throat> you know, it's it's frustrating because. I feel like education at times is like triage. Mm-hmm. They just kind of focus on who they feel deserves the, you know, who they feel like, I guess, deserves their attention versus trying to ensure that everybody is getting a fair shake. And it's fully reasonable. Look, like I went to public I school. It. I yeah. went to public school. And I, what can I ask of these teachers who are getting paid crap yeah. to teach yeah. way too many? It was 50, 60 kids in my class. Oh, you know, it was just pre- preposterous. Shit. And um, what can I ask of them yeah. when there's 14 kids that are yeah. really trying hard to I know. get good grades, to pass these tests and all that? I, I, I'm, I'm, it's certainly not, there's no like resentment or bitterness now looking back on it. Yeah. Um, and I think, look, like if I, like I said, if I could take my brain now and put it back in, I would have gone to my parents. I'd been like, mom, dad, uh, I really think I have a passion for this and yeah. I, I think I could be good at it. Yeah. Is there any chance I could try to go to Cal arts or, or yeah. transfer to a school for, for music or something? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny because like I, I wasn't a star academic athlete in mm-hmm. any way, shape or form. And I had a similar kind of experience where because I couldn't sit still because I couldn't focus for very long because I was that problem child that was constantly being told to sit back down or Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, I kind of felt a similar, um, like I was an I was a burden of sorts. Absolutely. I can, I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I felt that at times and not always I can, I can recall. It's funny too, because I can still recall the teachers that actually, put the effort in yeah. with me. They made such a lasting impression. I can still remember Miss Triani and Miss, Miss Evans. I can still remember their names. And they actually made the effort to simmer me down and try to channel me and make uh, the effort. So not all the teachers were um, that way, but you know, the, the difficulty is like you, you were saying there's a lot of kids and there's only so many resources. So I don't blame them when they kind of have to look at a triage scenario. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality. For sure. I mean, it's out of their hands. Exactly. Yeah. So you find a kind of like an inner flame with this bitterness that mm-hmm. pushes your creativity to a whole new level. Yeah. And and um, at least gave me it got me out of the laziness around art. Uh, like I really started. I I. I didn't own any instruments. Or I went, you know, to collected money from jobs. I had bought my first guitar, taught myself how to play guitar. No you know, like, and I was really into, I mean, I, there was, the motives were varied, but their part of the motive was like, I really wanted to express myself. And I thought it was like, a, I didn't want to be like in front of arenas and, and in limos. And yeah. like, I really was like, I just want to express myself. And I don't, and I used to draw, I, I still do. I'm a physical artist. I, I, I constantly am doodling and painting and nice. kind of expressing myself in that way. And uh, I wanted to be a performer and not for this, not for the attention. I'm, I'm sure that absolutely 
played a role, but more so is like, I really felt like I had something to say and I wanted to connect with people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like really passionate. Yeah. Yeah. And like the worst thing that could happen to me happened oh, oh, is no. that when I would graduate high school, I got uh, moved to San Francisco and kind of banged around up there. And I got into a band that actually had a little bit of success. Oh no. <laughs> that was the worst. Yes. Okay. I can't wait to hear this because I could easily trick myself into being like, I could do this forever uh, living just like this. And I was hanging out with guys who are my age now. And I was 19 wow. doing, doing drugs all day, oh. playing shows six days a week and like going from different towns in California and you know uh, Arizona and stuff. And, and uh, I thought like, and then we were opening up for like really successful bands. So I thought like oh, I yeah. could, I could do this. You see the path, but then really quickly, and this was, it was the worst thing that could happen to me in then now looking back on it, it's the best thing that happened to me because For sure. my addiction just went through the roof. Really? It was like, I went to boot camp where I was like kind of having fun with it casually yeah. drinking every day, smoke weed every day, but then I'd maybe get a little blow on the weekend yeah, yeah. to I'm waking up to drinking. I'm snorting cocaine every day. I'm <sighs> smoking crack. I'm, you know what I'm wow. saying? Like it went. Boom, you know, overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not <laughs> technically, but, but it's, it sure <laughs> seemed like it, you know? So I've heard from other people that the, like one day it, you have the realization that it's all of a sudden out of control. Yeah. You just like one day you realize shit and you don't pay attention to all the little things that happen beforehand. It's just one day, all of a sudden it's there. So that, was the same kind of experience for you? Yeah. And that's the worst part about drugs and alcohol is that they're so fun <laughs> so, and they work. Oh yeah. For their, whether for some people it's 25 years for me, it was uh, two years where they work, where wow. it's fun, yeah. where you don't Dude. have any real fallout, where yeah. you seem to be a little bit more interesting to girls, where oh, yeah. you seem to be a little bit more brave yeah. and, and you make cooler friends and, and people look at you differently and it, like, it's all working. Yeah. And then until they work until they don't Don't work. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, I think I definitely had at least subconsciously, yeah. I had an idea that I might have a problem because I came from a Mexican Irish right down the middle. Oh, jeez. And it's like, like, wow, like really almost <laughs> like, almost like cartoonish, the disaster that is alcoholism on both sides of yep. my family. Yep. Um, oh, and uh, so I, I definitely, and, and I had re a real clarity with what that disease was, seeing it in my own life. And um, so I think I, I sensed it, but I, I, it wasn't until it was far too late that I had that ability to go like, oh, I'm, well, I'm a drug addict. I'm not called. <sighs> and it didn't mean I stopped, but it was like, there was definitely yeah. an honesty where I was like, well, this is, it's clear. It's the only thing I care about in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, so- um, my grandfather was an alcoholic who, who passed away before I really got a chance to know him. I was too little, yeah. um, uh, liver cirrhosis. He, he was, uh, somewhat abusive to my dad's side of the family. Yeah. And my dad growing up, like was very strict about alcohol, would not allow yeah. it in the house with Like I never, I don't, I can't even recall ever seeing maybe at like a formal function. I might've seen him and my mom, my mom was fine with it, but my dad, mm -mm. And, um, I'm, I will go out on a limb and say that I have somewhat of an addictive personality. Mm -hmm. And when I got in the Navy and became, you know, somewhat independent, like, man, there, you know, like there's the stress of what you're doing, that you're downrange. And I can remember thinking, I've got this, I've got this under control. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I can't remember what point it was in my career, but it started to it started to affect my career. Like it really, in fact, in, in many cases it hurt my career. And one, I remember it was one deployment that I got in trouble and it was an alcohol related incident and it cost me significantly as far as my career was concerned. And I said, that's it. I'm done. And I went on a full six month deployment without drinking. And when I got back though, I was like, okay, I'm going to start drinking again because mm -hmm. you know, I did my six months. I did it. I stopped. I showed myself you showed yourself that exactly. I could do it. Right. I could control it in a sense, Oof, man. I don't know if it, 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 like they talk about the rebound effect, you know, when you go off of it for a while and then you go back on it, it, you, you kind of like go in a little bit deeper because of like the, the lack of time that you had with it. 
<clears throat> with opiates, um, any any opiate based stuff with the heroin uh, perks and, yeah. and uh, that that's a lot of the reason why people die. If Is you, it really? Especially, you know, I hate to you bring up names, but if you look at celebrities, yeah, most of them that are overdosing are both mixing them with benzos and then also had a had a good amount of time of sobriety. Yeah. And then they go back to Ooh. their drug of choice with the same appetite, but yeah. a completely different level of tolerance. Holy shit. And I then, didn't even realize you know, that. Like that makes Philip so Seymour much Hoffman and, and DJ AM. A lot of that's, you see, they're like, they were clean for a long time. And then yeah. They fell off and then boom. Oh man, dude, it was tough. Like I remember there was a time, there was about a two, three, like I remember my, my um, roommates, I'd come, they'd come home and then I would just be drinking in the house by myself, like before I'd go out and yeah. drink out in town. Right. And, um, the pre-party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like it, it was like not, you know, not, it's not, it's nothing really to brag about, but I would do that because it was just cheaper. You know, like sure. I could just bring home a bottle from the PX and start drinking and then go out. And I mean, and who, I mean, like, let, let's step away from it for a second. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I can't tell you when I was like first in radio, I can't tell you how many times I went to Taco Bell before I took a girl on a date because I, I wanted to fill up. I'll either, am I going to spend $60 on my own food or am I going to spend 16 and, but I still need calories. I love where your head's at, man. I love where your head's at. It's the same thing. It is. So it was, it was, um, that was a challenging part. Like I, and I try to talk to my, my son, I can already see, I have two sons and I can see one of them, both of them to some extent, but one of them for sure definitely has kind of a similar addictive personality Mm -hmm. and he's had trouble with, I was, he's had trouble with alcohol and fortunately he's trying to write himself. So that's good. But when I try to tell him, I was like, man, I, 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 I know what you think. Like I'm your dad. You look yeah. at me and you're like, oh, dad, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, no, I actually kind of do. Cause I almost ruined my, like I came so close to actually getting in so much trouble that it was irreparable. Yeah. So I think it was when I actually left the East coast and moved out to the West coast that things kind of started to peter down. Like the, the op tempo was almost gone. Uh, I was changing my, um, my viewpoint towards life. I I had at the time a girlfriend that we were very serious. She moved out with me. So it kind of like those, those all little, the, all those little life factors kind of cha- help change. I mean, I still drink occasionally. Um, I just don't have any interest in drinking excessively. Well, it's, I mean, I think the change is, if you're drinking because you enjoy alcohol and the feeling of it, like, well, that's what it's designed for. Right? Exactly. When you start drinking to kind of regulate the way you feel about the world and yourself. Exactly. That's when things get really messy. Oh, you know? I, I, and, and the same, by the way, same goes for food. Yeah. Same goes for drugs, of course. Yeah. Same goes for sex. Yeah. You know, and I, I'll be sober 21 years. Fucking up, A, man. Sure. Good for you. Thank you. But I will say, like, looking back on it, having had the time to kind of take some time to, to separate myself from it is like when I was a single man, uh, I never, never in a million years would have thought of myself as like having addiction, addiction problems with sex. Huh? But because I, 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 I was like, well, I love chicks. I'm horny and I'm <laughs> single and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a Mexican Italian. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm Irish, Mexican I'm Irish. I'm posing myself on these girls. Like I, I, I'm, you're I a good be, looking man. I'm be good with girls. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. So like, <laughs> but now looking back on it, I absolutely, there was a lot of girls that I was engaging in whatever activity with them yeah. to make myself feel better. Yeah. Like it had nothing to do. Yeah. Even if I was just horny and she was hot, that would be better than what I was doing. And I, I look back you. and I was like, I, I essentially used a human being. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, so it's just like, whatever that, whatever that switch is, is where it goes from. I like this yeah. and I enjoy it versus I, I feel depressed. This. So I'm going to take this yes. or I'm going to have sex with this, or I'm going to eat this and make, hopefully make myself feel better. You know, it's so funny too, because I think when you can attach it to that emotional side of, yeah. of our, of our brain chemistry, it makes it a little bit easier for you to try to acknowledge it. When yeah. you can recognize the what like what you just said, I feel like is so important that it needs to be said again. The difference between those two paths, and when you are rec- when you recognize that what you're doing, you're doing to make yourself feel a different way to move outside of who you are. Yeah, that's where you really have. That's where the road gets really dicey. And so for you, twenty one years, what was the 
what was the break point for you? What, I mean, was there it's, a major event? Like, yeah. for, like for me, it was like almost losing my career. What was it for you? Well, there was, but it was, it's so odd that <laughs> there was tons of major events. Oh, really? <laughs> and then, you know, after the kind of music thing, the music experiment, my parents, and I moved back to LA cause I was broken and, and I had kind of petered out on that. Yeah. And my parents kind of gave me, it was very loving. It wasn't kind of, and, and this is odd for my parents because my parents are not only Mexican and Irish, but also my mom grew up really poor, like, like not knowing if we're going to eat tonight poor. My dad was just lower middle class mm. and, and came from a military family. My dad worked at the Pentagon, was military himself um, before he got in the private sector. So there was not a lot of like, there was not a lot of margins for me to work with. It was either there, this is right or wrong, son, and you can do right or you can do wrong. And this is, you know, it was very regimented. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and with my mom, I certainly understood that because, uh, my mom had no opportunities. Mm -hmm. There was zero opportunities. Just stay alive was a, was opportunity. So for her to have, look at her child who had every opportunity in the world, yeah. I, I wasn't, you know, one of the Trumps or anything, but I, we were affluent enough that like, if I want to go to college, my parents could pay for college. If nice. I wanted to eat anything I want, they could, it, the refrigerator is full. So Life was very open for me, and she was watching me just be like, ah, fuck that. Mm. You know, to her, it was it was very, uh, probably very hurtful. Mm. Um, no probably about it. Yeah, yeah, no, no probably, <laughs> exactly. No probably about it. Um, but, so I said, okay, uh, I'll try college. I'll try this thing. And so I, mm. I started, I got, I got regular jobs, and then I went to junior college and kind of got my life back together a little bit. Still just partying like crazy so but i was like at least at least i changed my mind frame i was like i'll give this normal person life a chance right okay so i did junior college for two years and then i went to rutgers in nice. new jersey because i was like i'm gonna learn how to like farm and stuff i, I, I then oh. i transitioned from from <laughs> i transitioned from <laughs> kerouac to like i was gonna be like steinbeck and i was gonna be like this oh, kind of like american farmer yeah you know? yeah 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 and it was either UC Davis in California or Rutgers yeah. in, in New Jersey that were really well regarded for their agricultural stuff. For sure. Program. Well, this was 1999 now. Oh, wow. 2000. And the Jersey punk scene is exploding. <laughs> like, I this saw. dragged you back in. I saw My Chemical Romance's first show with the dudes from Thursday. Dillinger Escape Plan is playing across the street. I mean, it was just like the Northeast punk hardcore scene was just like blowing up. Oh, wow. And I was like, Done. wow, Turn awesome. So I just never went to class. Never. And I just oh. immersed myself in it. You know? Nice. And, uh, <laughs> there was like the straight edge scene. And then there was like the yeah. guys I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it got really dark. Like real. that's when it got, really? there was no happiness. There wasn't even a, a, any ability for me to, um, to lie to myself that this was still recreation. It was really dark. It was really sad and dark. And everything about my life was just this continual cycle of pain and like, uh, anesthetizing it with drugs and alcohol and then pain and drugs. Yeah. You know, it was a vicious cycle. I was starting. Uh, that's when I'd always been a stimulant fan. I'd always been, <laughs> I'd, I always love booze. I always love stimulants. I love meth. I love cocaine. I love it. <laughs> But in the East Coast, that's when I started smoking speedballs and I would mix heroin with it. Oh, wow. And I would start overdosing so frequently that it wasn't like surprising or weird for me to like wake up in the or like wake up in an ambulance or wake up with Are the, you the e me? EMTs there. Yeah. Holy shit. And that was that. I mean, that's how dark that got. I woke up. Then I, clearly I ran out of money. I was getting, you know, it's, I got, I had <laughs> it's a little out, bit of an expense. I went out for my arrest. And, and so I moved back to. To, what was the uh, warrant for? I, there was two D, one in Pennsylvania and one in uh, New Jersey, DYs. Yeah, that'll do it. And which is, you know, the, the worst crime that like normal people commit. It's just, just such a crazy thing to do, especially yeah. nowadays with Uber and stuff. It's just insane too. So true. But I did. And I was, I would, and I would drive a hundred times over because I was so beholden to drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Um, but then I also, there was this weird, uh, like frat guy giant brawl that happened that I had nothing to do with. Okay. <laughs> and some dude, uh, kind of like in the, in the fringes of it, just like attacked me. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, 
trying to explain this guy, like trying to physically <laughs> defend myself and explain this guy. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know who this crap. I don't even know. What, <laughs> is this still Rutgers or are we at Seton Hall? I don't know where I am. Oh I God. want, I want heroin. Like, you know, <laughs> and the, the, this, I think this was in New Brunswick and Whoa. the cops just arrested everybody. Oh yeah, right? dude. Oh yeah. And I was scared to call an attorney because that meant I'd have to call my parents because I had no money. Oh shit. But when they go and they're checking me in and everyone who got arrested, all these frat guys, I was the only one who had like a quarter ounce of cocaine in there. <laughs> so I was like, oh. so then I had to break, I had to break down and, and call my parents. And yeah. hold them. So they're like, let's listen, we, we need you back here. We can at least keep an eye on you. And my sister, who's a lot older than me, I, I think it was a mistake. She married LAPD and they lived like a mile from my parents. Oh, wow. So he, it, Along with him, my parents, my sister, everyone was kind of like, listen, just let's tie you back down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no, no problem. Fine. So I started kind of rethinking what I wanted to do. I'm 20, 21 years old now. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I, let me go back to that mind frame of when I really first started thinking I wanted to be a musician Mm -hmm. where I didn't. I didn't want to be like Axl Rose. Like I just wanted to express myself. And I used to spend hours. I used to be spending, I I would like, sometimes the sun would go down and I wouldn't re I would be like, Oh my God, I haven't left my bedroom. And the sun's because I'd just be like writing different ideas and drawing pictures and playing guitar. And I was like, I started playing at like 10 (laughs) AM. So I had that. I had it. It was a real thing. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. And so I did that. But then I also had this horrible appetite, you know, so then I got uh, in a car accident Ooh. Uh, that wasn't my fault. I was in the passenger seat uh, going to buy drugs. I saw horrible things like the meth scene. Drugs will surround you with people you don't want to be around, but nothing compares to meth. Really? Oh, my God. Like the, 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 the horrible wow. neo-Nazis and meth cooks and just the, uh, it was just a horribly violent uh, dog fighting and everything. Wow. And I was, and all of this had happened, like, and I had been beaten up. I had had all females just completely, I was ostracized from all females because yeah. I was, I was a pile of shit. My parents were really disappointed in me and I would see my mom cry. The whole, all of these things happen and all of them, I would continue drinking and using. And the day I stopped, I was in a hotel, a motel in, <laughs> in Inglewood, uh, I had tinfoil pipe and I was smoking rocks. And for no reason whatsoever, I can't remember this for this, this experience without thinking of it. Like I'm seeing myself on closed circuit TV. I don't remember it in my first person perspective. I can't remember it that way, but I I do remember clearly I was watching like Jenny Jones happen to be on, on the TV and I'm like packing a pipe and I'm in my underwear. It's like 11 in the afternoon. And there was a, a, there was a, a mirror. At the edge of this like TV thing yeah. where the bed went into it. And I'm sitting at the edge of the bed. So this mirror's right in front of me. And I just happened to look up and look at myself in the mirror. Huh. And I got overwhelmed by this weird feeling that I couldn't really understand. And I walked over to the bedside and looked if there was a yellow pages. And I started calling rehab facilities. Yeah. And I was like, that's, and that was it. Huh. There was no wild experience tied to it. I was just sitting there and I had this weird epiphany that like, I'm really young yeah. now and maybe I can have a chance at having a good life. Yeah. But I really got to stop drinking and using drugs. That's, <sighs> it, was, it was, it was, it was as if it became super clear huh? and I, I just did it. And that was the last time I drank. Or used wow. <laughs> That's a pretty vivid recollection. I imagine, you know, looking, I think sometimes you have a, a mental image of what, you think you look like, yeah. but then when you actually see what you really have become, mm-hmm. it can be life changing. In your case, it was, it, uh, it really was. And I think like we were talking about before the show, Oh my God, if there was smartphones back in our <laughs> days, oh, oh, like all the, but no, oh my God, if there were smartphones back in the day and maybe I had a chance to see myself at 17, 18, 19, I, I, I might've, true. I might've, that could be true. That could, that, that's, that's a truth that, I sometimes struggle with too, like 
maybe I would have been more like, you know, text messaging would have been there. My, my, my teammates probably would have been hounding me to come do something with them. Yeah. I, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, so when you finally did, you, so you thumbed through the, the yellow pages, this is how bad, this is how old yeah. it is. You know, that when yellow pages used to be in hotel rooms, yep. did you, did you like open the yellow pages and point to one and said, this is it. I'm going here. It took me a while, but I, I, I went, to like medical then it, you know it's alphabetical but there was like a section i think for like mental health and like then you could see like drug and mental health drug re- yeah, rehabilitation. Yeah, 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 yeah. so i started calling places seeing if they had beds and uh one of the first places i called was this place lost in Cenas because it was in pasadena okay. near where i grew up yeah yeah and they said they had a bed for me and they said they could they could take me obviously it cost money but i i i, I just assumed that <laughs> if i was very honest with my parents that that would be something that they could take care of and so I bit my ego really hard and the next call was to my parents. Oh, nice. And they said, awesome. Great. You know, like, of course, anything to help you. And I awesome. said, they go, where are you? I go, I think I'm in Inglewood. Uh, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> so they called my ex-girlfriend who was friendly enough with me, even though we were like you couldn't be with me at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she, she drove out and picked me up, drove me back to my house. And that night, I checked in and that was, that was the end of it, man. So you just, it was one and done. No, oh. I had, I had, I had been, I, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> it was one and done with me doing it on my own. It was okay. one and done with me making the decision on my own. Right, right. Twice judges had forced me to go. Really? Once my parents had forced me to go. Okay. Um, both of those three times, or sorry, all of those three times, uh, it didn't work yeah. because I didn't have any internal desire to do it. I was doing it to appease them. Mm, and, you hadn't uh, reached that point yet. Yeah. Interesting. When did you reach the point? It was, I, I, I gotta think it was that, that moment in that hotel. It was so very strange that moment in that motel. So you um, had tried rehab centers before then. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I, and I, I see, I see, I see. To, twice when I was living on the East coast. I see there. One time I went to this like world renowned place in Minnesota called the Hazelden Institute. Yeah. I like actually they, have heard they, about they, that. They like base a lot of 12 step recovery off of this place. It was so well. And it was nice. It was a great experience certainly. But, uh, it was like a couple of weeks before I got out after I got out when I was using again, huh. I was just thinking, I mean, even flying out of Minnesota to go back to the East coast, I was on my flight. I was like, where how, can I get how, some? How long how, is this going to last? Yeah, really? How can like, I score some? You know? So Las Cimas, Las, in, Las Encinas, Las Encinas. Yeah. Um, how long were you there for? 28 days, like the standard, mm. you know? but I actually took it seriously. I took it seriously. 28 days. And then I did aftercare where I was going to a meeting every day. I forgot a sponsor. I did the whole thing. Mm. You know, I didn't date for a year. I didn't start any new relationships and, and I started getting job like ordinary jobs just to pay the bills. So yeah. I, I didn't have to be living with my parents, you know, it was yeah. kind of a bummer. And I really felt, uh, really felt extra bummed out because they had spent all this money and all this mm. worry trying mm. to get me healthy. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I was like, I got to just do show something. that I can do something yeah. on my own. No, I get so that. I got a bunch of like normal guy jobs. And I was, I was working in construction and I was a janitor at this prosthetics lab, which was amazing for comedy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, I'll but bet. I was, I was a night watchman at um, a rehearsal studio. For, you know, like they, bands would gig oh, okay. and like yeah, rehearse yeah. there. And I would just check them in and be like, all right, $25 for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> and it was in the Valley in Los Angeles. And there was a lot of really good, really well-known bands. Yeah. And maybe not sometime, a lot of times like bands that hadn't made it yet. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, crazy. It's really weird. That sounds so cool. Um, but I, and I was like, I had this idea that I was going to do it the right way. Now that I was clean and sober, I was uh-huh. going to. So then I saw with fire. Yeah. I saw they put up on the little, you know, the little pieces of paper with like the little yeah, yeah, the, pins you could pull yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. There was a, 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 a an ad for a job opening at K Rock, K R O Q F M. But it was like entry level. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, like you gotta drive the jocks around. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. Go hand out stickers and t-shirts. California right. coachman. Yeah. That's and, it. So I was like, well, I mean, I could it, it, it was part time and I was I was like, it's better than working other places. Sure. I could at least be around rock radio you yeah know? so i and i called and they hired me huh and i was there for a short time before i 
not with any intention of doing anything, <laughs> uh, with transitioning into yeah. a, a career. I started like prank calling the morning show. I started screwing with all the other employees, all the jocks. I would, I would, I would bust their balls. I was going, I was reverting back to what really made me happy when yes. I was a kid, you know? You were in an environment where it was actually almost condoned. It, it was the first time in my entire life. And that not only, I was like, wait, you're not. I remember I prank called the morning show bad one time. Oh, no. And then the morning show guys came out. And it was 6.30, 6 in the morning to 10 in the yeah, morning. Yeah. There's not a lot of employees in a radio station. Yeah, of course. I had to be there because I had to go do some. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, just screw it from the other room. And then I see Kevin and Bean, who I don't really know. They walk out. Or at least Kevin did because Bean was doing it from remote. And I was like, oh, you're not. He laughed so hard when he found out. I was. He was like, that was you? I was like, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, wait, you're not mad at me. You're not going to yell at me. You're not going to talk down to me. I was like, this is so strange. Yeah. So then I got a bug up my ass and I started stealing the mic flags that say K-Rock on them. I would literally steal them and I would go to red carpets Oh no with way. the K-Rock vehicles. Oh, no and way. And I would interview people and I would bring the morning show to tapes and I would just throw it. And they're like, she got this. And I was, I was, I was an asshole. Like I was just trying to bust balls. Yeah. Know? I wasn't even being professional. Uh, it was... <laughs> And then they hired me. <laughs> and then I had this job where people, all the fart jokes, all the class clown stuff, where, re out. where I really, uh, genuinely, I wasn't just doing it to get attention. Like, I yeah. really get goosebumps when I think about, like, stupid, lowbrow comedy. Yeah. Like, it really always made me laugh so hard. I, when we had our graduation ceremony, I, in, our, in my gown, I had uh, uninflated beach balls. OK, uh -huh. so I snuck them in. They were just blow, blow, yeah. blow, like six of them. And while the graduation, like valedictorian yeah. speaking, yeah. I'm blowing them up. <laughs> <laughs> and I had extreme porn magazines oh, in God. my bag. next, And I started <laughs> just like taping it. To, the and balls. then I would and hit it like that. And it was like, oh, beach ball. And they'd be like, oh, and I just hear from like every area and it was like it was like really bad like hustler and black tail it was like like extreme you know oh God. <laughs> and I, I, I when i say that when i was listening to all the other kids like i'm going to harvard i'm going yeah. to x neighbor and i'm sitting i was like i'm so happy shut up everyone shut up <laughs> <laughs> my friend cj and i repelled from the gym and epoxied a giant like a two-foot dildo to the top of the gym in an area where only you had to there's it took them Three weeks to get it down because they couldn't get up there. It was like a rounded. <laughs> and my friend happened to be like a, a kind of good rock climber. And he's like, we could do this. You know? and I, I was, and, you know, like, so now I have adults, successful adults gather and they're like more do do this. Yes. You know? And even more so than anything, you're good at this. You could. And I never had anybody tell me that before oh, my wow. entire life. Wow. And that was 2003. And that's how I got into radio. And that's how I got it, like anything that I have in my life. Quick word from our sponsor. We've been working with the folks at 1776 for comprehensive insurance of our firearms collections. And um, I'm really happy with how things are going so far. And one of my concerns is with the amount of commuting that I do with my firearms collection, um, what happens should my vehicle be broken into or stolen with my firearms? And there's reason to have this concern because there's 800,000 vehicles stolen per year in America. So it's not... You know, it's it's a little bit more common than what we might think. What I mentioned earlier is that they have a comprehensive insurance plan, which is that they will cover your firearms stolen out of your vehicle or should your vehicle be stolen, cover the firearms that were in the vehicle. So that's pretty, you know, pretty reassuring in a sense. So I've mentioned this before, but the process to apply is pretty easy. Uh, approval is pretty quick. They do not require you provide a itemization or serialized numbers. There's no appraisal or schedules that you have to provide. So really all you want to do is just make sure you have proof of ownership and that's it. So if you want to learn more about the folks from 1776 and insuring your firearms collection, visit 1776insurance.com. First of all, what an amazing journey. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's so true. Like the ups and downs of that early part to get you where you were at. I mean, I have a question yeah. because I'm sure that I'm not the only one that doesn't really know much about the inner workings of rehab mm. but what really happens what 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 made it work for you that time other than you're sitting yourself you look staring in the mirror and you saw all that and you said okay was there something within the rehab structure 
that actually gave you the right tools to be able to maintain that for 21 years? Um, you know, all the rehab facilities I went to were 12 step based. Yeah. And I think that the only difference with the last one, because all of them had amazing tools and gave me amazing ability to deal with the disease. The last time, the only difference was, is that I genuinely had a burning desire to stop using drugs and drinking. Mm. I really did. I really wanted to stop. Mm. And that made, that's uh, the change. That everything. made all, all the difference. Change everything. Yeah. When, you know, six, eight months before that, when I had tried at another facility and I was, uh, and people are like, well, you gotta, you gotta give up on this and that for now. At least, you know, yeah. you, maybe you don't talk to those guys anymore. Yeah. You know, the guys that you used to use with maybe for at least a while, maybe you're yeah. not prepared. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta <laughs> And, um, you know, you got to get a sponsor. You got to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Wow. You know, probably more for a guy like you who's so young and so, and, and dealing with such a serious, serious, I was like, okay, yeah, sure. What? This time they're like, you got to, you got to get a sponsor. You got to do And I was like, okay. okay. Deal. Done. Deal. You know, chicken, you know? And that, awesome. that all that all it was was like I really wanted it. Yeah. You know? That's such a major difference. And it kind of like, you really wanted that. And you also like your path, you really wanted to be in a place where you can express yourself and you really wanted that to the point where it became a reality. Yeah. And it, and it's like, look, Lord knows. I mean, I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> some world beater that has everything figured out. But one thing I did notice through that experience, through, through sobriety, through meeting my wife, it's like you, th all of the things that come to you in life that are really meaningful. Yeah. They're like butterflies and it, you can't chase after them huh. with the singular idea of getting them huh. because they're just going to run away more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, they're, they're, they're like, they're like uh beautiful flowers. You just got to keep, keep watering. Hmm. Just keep what maybe, maybe this time it didn't work out, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but keep putting the fertilizer, keep yeah. watering dude. And it'll happen because if you make that say, like, I was like, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm just, yeah. And then it's, of course, you know, the, everything gets wonky. Oh yeah. It, it happens fast too. the wonkiness. Um, so now you're with K rock and yeah. you're living the dream, if you will. Mm. Like it sounds like that environment actually encouraged you to continue to push the boundaries because you came up with, I mean, the, the song that you came up with, the characters that you came up with, mm. all of that. It just seems like they were like, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, um, and I got really, cause I'm a, I'm a very, uh, I'm not like a thick skinned guy. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, some of my friends who are standups, uh, like I can see them bomb and they, they're like, yes, yeah, so I, 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 I'm very sensitive to things like that. You yeah. know, and I, I, um, but yet, when it came, when at that point in my life, it was, it was like, so this bit failed. Yeah. So I'm going to run out, you know, I'm going to go streaking at Dodger Stadium. <laughs> like, whatever it was, like if I Did had- you really go streaking? Yeah. I, I mean, I, <laughs> so funny, my, my, my wife, my wife always points out, she's like, you hate, I hate taking my shirt off. Uh, just for, just for like, like for, if, if people, because I work out a lot yeah, and yeah, I yeah. eat egg yeah, whites and yeah, yeah. crap that no one likes to eat, people are like, wanting me especially early in my career where yeah. i was transitioning into television they were like well let's do like the the men's fitness <laughs> photo shoot and i was like no that was good but if they're like it would be hysterical if you pulled your cock out right now <laughs> I'd, it, i'm doing a second like you know what i'm saying it was so weird that i if it that's, was that's a big extreme <laughs> right no but i i I, I I would never like I, I've had lots of offers. Yeah. Of people who are like, let's do the like topless photo shoot. And I remember one time TMZ caught when I was doing Dancing with the Stars. TMZ literally caught me coming out of the water at Venice Beach, uh -huh. and I was so pissed. <laughs> I was so pissed because I was like, it doesn't matter what really happened. Yeah, yeah. People are gonna go into TMZ. Are they gonna watch the show tonight? And they're gonna think like, look at Mr. Muscle Man <laughs> showing off his honey glazed body. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, I don't want that. Like, yeah. Why didn't they just tell me I would have worn like a woman's bikini? That would have been funny. And yes. I, like casually did yeah. the yeah. interview as if yeah. I w there was nothing. Yeah, yeah, wrong, yeah. You know, like. Uh, anyway. Yeah, that's hilarious. But I did. I found this environment. The um, where 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 I was, I felt encouraged to be myself. I, exactly. I, I, I was an adolescent, and uh, every position of authority in my life. Yeah. Some to some were 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 um 
hostile about it. Some were truly uh, caring and yeah. loving, but everyone always tried to like beat that out of me. Yeah. That I was this. Uh huh. Just mod- like school. I, I was like a macho guy, yeah. but I also, I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a, bo- a little boy. Yeah. I love, I love cartoons and I love yeah. silly shit and I yeah. love fart jokes and I love, I loved it. <laughs> and everyone had always tried to beat that out of me and yeah. they would always, um, and, uh, I was now around adults. Yeah. Successful ones. Yeah. That they were like, no, this is, this is great. Go, go. <laughs> You know, when, so like, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 te- the, you know, in my younger adult life, you know, I was in an environment where it was very serious. Everything yeah. was always very serious life or death at times, you know, training was always life or death. Real world was always life or death, but I couldn't help it. It's like, sometimes it was just too intense. And like, I felt like there had to be a little levity. Yeah. And, and even in the worst of times, like I can remember the like specific times where shit is like not going well or things are going sideways. And I would just like crack a joke and everybody starts laughing. I'd be like, see, that's that's kind of like what we needed just to kind of take a wrap off of what's happening. And laughter, in my opinion, is probably one of the greatest gifts that we have yeah. that we don't really appreciate a lot of times. Like it was people were trying to suppress that in you and not let you express yourself yeah. naturally. And so like, I felt very comfortable around my guys just being like, like, like again, the fart jokes, like here we are, we're adults, we're grown ass men doing something. You know, the government has trusted us. The American people has trusted us to go down range and do this stuff. Yet we're cracking fart jokes in the process. But you, you know? I mean, that gallows humor goes back to as long as there's been combat, right? Yeah. You know, it's, that's almost, true. it's almost an that's, essential. Yeah. It absolutely is. To kind of deal with absolutely. The, the reality of 100%, what you're doing, you know? man. It's so true. Like, uh, I think the guys that can actually do that <clears throat> and see the worst that war has to offer and still be able to have the ability to, with one another, see that levity and see the importance behind it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree. That's why I think the, um, like the comedy tours for that the USO puts together are yeah. so important. So very important. All right, so you're killing it with K Rock, and you're coming up with all these characters. Like, what was the inspiration behind some of these, like, landmark characters that you had? Um, it was either like it was a legitimate celebrity that either I genuinely did a good impersonation of them, which right. was not as frequent, <laughs> or there was some comedy into doing it. Like, there was like it was a more of a stylized, yeah. like, like Kevin, I, I. I got, I got a lot of leverage out of, especially in that era where like reality TV and, and, and that whole like celebrity reality world was yeah. really blowing up, you know, yeah. the Paris Hilton's and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was like really a thing the Hills yeah. and the yeah. Laguna beach on MTV. Yeah. You know? yeah. I did an impersonation of Kevin Federline and uh, which who, who at the time was Britney Spears husband. So oh. he was, uh, <laughs> memory is very short. Yeah. And I did this impersonation that got me, a, a lot of eyeballs on me, yeah, and a yeah. lot of, but also got me in a lot of trouble because numerous people always would think it was really Kevin Federline because not a lot of people had heard him. Oh, wow. And I was just doing like a wigger. I wasn't like, yeah, I was just like, yo, what's up, dog? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm just smoking, <laughs> smoking weed, spending Britney's money. <laughs> and then someone somewhere in the Britney Spears camp would hear that. And they're like, Kevin's on Kevin and Bean talking about <laughs> watching Scarface and smoking weed for Britney's money. <laughs> I don't know where the kids are, dog. What's up with it? And <laughs> and then next thing you know, it's like then be a lawsuit. And then of course that no would get thrown. It's like it's parody. You can't sue him. Yeah. And then CBS CBS radio would hire attorneys for me. And then I so there was oh, like wow, this combating oh. of like people were laughing and I was getting a lot of and then there was also like the legal the negative, aspect. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and then I would do like Spencer Pratt, you know, like which <laughs> I is not a a a, a spot. I'm not like uh you know, um, uh, Daryl Hammond, who's doing these spot on, but it was like a stylized thing. It was like this guy who's bragging about constantly yeah. talk, telling women they're too fat and that his wife's the hottest. And I drive a Bentley. Like, but we're talking about the Ukraine. It's yeah. like, yeah, but my Bentley, sick. <laughs> gold rim, sick. you know, like these just, just like vapid yeah, kind of yeah. reality stars. You know? <laughs> so it, it, honestly, it came from uh, the fact that I hit the gold mine and I had this job where preparation for your job was sitting around with a bunch of like-minded dudes going, wouldn't it be funny if, if I love then, that one, you know, so That's it, the best. it was it, it, as things you would look at the internet or the newspaper that day. And you'd be like, uh, Oscar de la Hoya is fighting. Like pretty sure I could, 
pull off an Oscar. <laughs> just like a little more effeminate Mexican guy. Hey, hey, you're a Filipino. You want to be Manny Pacquiao? And like, you just go, you know, like that, that, that intern's Filipino. Just say some tech log, tech log stuff. Yeah, and, I'll, yeah, yeah. and I'll talk like this. Eh? Te quiero mucho, East LA. I'm going to give you the big jab right to your face. I'm a cafe, you know, like. How you like just, that? Yeah. How you like that? Uh, you can say all you want about me not being from the streets because I dress the way I dress or I look the way I look. But we'll see coming Saturday night when you step in the ring, you know, and you're like. Love it. Yeah, you do. Lo- I, you know, I love it too. You know why? Because I was one of those guys. But you, if Oscar De La Hoya stepped in that room, I would shut the fuck <laughs> up because he would fuck me up. And he did it over and over again. Oh, he god. did it over again. Oh god, that is hilarious. Oh god. All right, I, I like one of my favorites. Uh, one one of my favorites that you have or that you had that actually went to the next level and became an animated series yeah. was your character Rudy. Yeah, dude, that. Well, Rudy's <laughs> different. Because as I was saying with all the other stuff, yeah. I was like, you know, I would see Gene Simmons come into the studio to promote stuff. And he was so crazy. Like oh, Gene, yeah. Yeah, he, he's not naturally crazy, yeah. but his persona yeah. is so preposterous <laughs> that I had to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Rudy was different. Rudy yeah. was more of like Quentin Tarantino. I heard Quentin Tarantino talk about the movies he'd make where he said, people think that Django's a spoof of spaghetti westerns or that kill bill is a spoof of these um martial arts martial arts movies he's like no it's it's an homage yeah there's a there's a there's an aspect of it where it's pointing out how crazy they yeah 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 yeah, yeah. when you see the blood um but it's really it's a love letter because i love these movies so much that's the same way i felt it's like i not only grew up with family members but in a world in los angeles uh even if you don't like live in the hood, it, you, it's like Kid Rock once told me, he's like, everyone from Detroit's a little black. It's like, you know, <laughs> everyone in LA is a little, you know, and I, I was Mexican and I had these family members and I had a really weird persona, be, or a really weird perspective because my dad's side of the family was like really white. My mom's side of the family is straight, like East Los Angeles, yeah. Chicano, yeah, yeah, yeah. real like yeah. roots dug in yeah. Mexicans from yeah. Los Angeles. And I would see this culture and I would go to Dodger Stadium. My parents always had season tickets to Dodgers oh, and Lakers. I love it. And I would go to Dodger Stadium and I would hear the mariachi music and 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 the guys in the right field pavilion, the like the Dodger of their life. And and you you would drive and see these murals of the Virgin Mary and these guys who would spend ex- insane amount of time on their tattoos and candy flaking their low riders. Yes. And the culture was so vibrant and so amazing that I I I wanted to to like do this character yeah. to, to as a, as a, like a tip of the cap. And then B, because uh, I wanted to also point out how, how kind of funny it is. Oh, dude, you know? it, that, that like that, like the series, I, I, w- I, I wish I could have watched more, but I watched the one scene where he gets smacked by the, the uh, Bobolito with the chukla. And Oh my God, I just was laughing my ass off. Cause that was just such a perfect scene. Cause I can, I like, I grew up also, yeah. you know, <clears throat> my family, um, very, very, you know, entrenched in Mexican culture. And I, I remember going to the Sunday dinners or Sunday, Sunday afternoon football slash dinner kind of thing. And, uh, like there was more than one time when I saw either the wooden spoon coming at you yeah. or the, or the shoe getting, getting thrown across the room. Yeah. Oh, like the matrix. Yeah. Turning corners. Dude, or... it was crazy. Like yeah. I, I tell people like. If you got into the kitchen, this was a funny story. If you if you walked into the kitchen while all the moms were making the food, <clears throat> there was like a little part of the table where they would put it wasn't final final the meal wasn't finished, but they would have to take the there wasn't enough space on the stove top, so they'd have to take some of the food and put it on the edge of the table and then they'd have to go back to prepping and cooking the rest of the food and then they'd come back and put that food in there. So I would make these little like bomber runs into yeah. the kitchen and I'd swoop in and grab, I literally just, I'm not grab a handful of the, the meat or the beans or whatever it was, the rice. I remember the rice one time, grab it in my hands and run out of the kitchen and I'd share it with all my cousins. You know, we'd go outside and one time, one time as I'm like, I'm reaching in and my hand, my palms are almost flat. Like I'm about to do this. And one of my aunts just took that wooden spoon whack right on the palm of my hand. Woo! That sent a shit. Like I can recall that sting on my palm, oh, and worse. I was like, so like when I saw the the shoe come across, I'm like, oh my god, I remember that. So, um, so the animated series, 
took off from a personality that you'd created for the radio show. Yeah. How did that kind of I think go? I mean I think that's one of the weird benefits of doing any type of media in LA is that you know at this time I now I was hosting the a part of the morning show and then hosting Love Line at night. Yeah. And writers for name a show they would hear they would hear me on the radio. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes stumbling, sometimes hit, hitting yeah. you know getting a home run and and uh, this guy reached out to me. He re- actually reached out to my manager at the time and he wrote this guy, Robert Patton, he wrote for the office and he's like, oh, wow. I listen to Loveline every night. And uh, when you do Rudy, it's, it, there's gotta be something there we can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, you're right. You're totally right. <laughs> you, and uh, we went at it. We went at it. Uh, initially we were dead set on making a live action show. We were just going to do like a sketch comedy show or like a, huh. maybe sit, develop a sitcom. You know? Yeah. I was like, yeah, no, it's funny. And I was thinking of like how funny that would be. But then like we were getting, like we talked about earlier, there was that part of me that wanted, I wanted to go goofy. I wanted to be sillier. Yeah. And then I presented the idea yeah. of animated. Yeah. I was like, because like sitcom's funny. Yeah. But what if I could fly to Mars? Yeah. What if he- Take it to another uh, level. What if I go to the center, I dig to the center of the other. I remember Bugs Bunny when I was a kid dug a hole so deep he ended up in China and I, I was a one. little kid and I was like I'm gonna go in the backyard I'm gonna start digging right now and my mom was furious and I was like what if I can make Rudy digs to China yeah. you know and so he said wow that's actually a very interesting idea because my co-star or the you know the star one of the stars of the office Ed Helms just opened his up his own production company and he's dead he really wants to make animated adult animated huh. I was like well let's take it by by his uh Purview, sir. And sure enough, he was he was into it. Nice. Next, you know, it all happened. You know? Gosh, that's so cool. All right. So things are really rocking for you. You know, like you're kind of like riding a wave of success. What was like the next big su- success for you then? Well, it was weird because uh, I was financially, I was I, made, I was making more money than I ever thought I could. It was ridiculous. That's I never awesome. thought I could make money like that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I really didn't. I thought only people who got master's degree at, you know, Wharton mm-hmm, and, and went mm-hmm. to, or, you know, were mm-hmm. at Columbia. Yep. Like the, I, I didn't think that, that, that happened. Uh, and I certainly didn't think it happened in the entertainment industry to people like me. I thought like Brad Pitt makes a lot of money. Yeah. 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 I will stumble. I'll, I'll be lucky to be like Kevin and Bean who had an amazing career in yeah. morning radio. Yeah. Yeah. Know? But I, I'm not going to make lots of then TV comes into the game and there's, there's people just throw money at you. And you're like, wow. Hey. Oh, but I was starting to have, I, I had the Rudy thing. Yeah. You know, at Comedy Central. And then they didn't program it after like two years and they let me out. And then like, now we're talking 2016, 2017. Yeah. Okay. Trump comes into the world. Now, no one really wants to put this on TV because it's really edgy. You know, and they're like, is this, this, this little bit of a, I'm almost a Mexican minstrel act. And I'm oh, like, oh, my God. oh, oh is it? You're Waspy kidding. white guy from the <laughs> middle of the country? You're going to tell me that this is, you could suck my balls with how. Um, and then, My so, manscaped balls, yes, by the way. Very well manscaped balls. <laughs> and uh, so we sold it to Quibi after, you know, we kind of got some flack from like more traditional outlets. Um, and then Quibi went under. Ah. <sighs> But this whole time, I'm making a living by hosting TV shows. Yeah, like for, like Dude, like you've got so many, like like really straight and forward TV, uh, entertainment tonight, Access yeah. Hollywood, yeah. You know, kind of stuff, you know. And uh, do not get me wrong, all everyone I ever worked with at E News, at Access Hollywood, at Entertainment, uh, they're all great people, and I like doing. And they're uh, it's a happy environment. Yeah, it's one of those things like not snarky. There was I like all those people, but I was. Uh, I was really miserable because I had gone on this trajectory where I was really feeling like I was developing that flower that was the authentic me. Uh And now people are paying me, granted, a lot of money to go talk about like what Lady Gaga wore at the Oscars. And I'm like, can I make fun of that? And they're like, you better not. Or it's like, you'll be in a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like the president of NBC is... His office is right there. You will <laughs> You'll be in that wreck office. Your ass, you know? I'm like, wait, but her suits meet. I can't. <laughs> like, we're just going to talk. That. We're going to talk. Ser- like, I can't make fun of that, you know? 
or I'd interview. I'd be literally interviewing celebrities. And for the most part, I have to do, I have to say this because everyone has this idea that like celebrities take themselves too seriously. They're all kind of like vapid and, 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 and narcissists. Most celebrities had such a good sense of humor about themselves that I would bust their chops and I'd be at like the, the Toronto film festival or Sundance, right. Yeah. You know, doing these things where Bradley Cooper's going from room to room to room. Yeah. It's like CNN, this room, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the access Hollywood room. Yeah. And most people would think like, who's the, he was like, Oh, it's so nice to do this interview because I've been asked the same 10 questions. Yeah. Right. You know, and I, you know, I just, Silly things like you would say, I'm sure you would say to fellow other fellows in the military or guys on sports teams, with, yeah. you know, yeah. like just get you a know, cup check type. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, just yeah. Silly bullshit, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, huh. And uh, and then but then I, I I was told very, very clearly that you can't do that here. This is, you know, here's questions you can ask. To, oh and so God. I got really I got this real sense, like a real dip, real sense of like depression because I was like, oh. So the only way I can continue to succeed from yeah. this point yeah. is to start doing stuff I don't really want to do. Right. Because I'm not going to host The Tonight Show or I'm yeah. not going to, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to, they're not going to make the Rudy movie like Borat. Yeah. Like, because. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Like, they, they pull back just enough where I would be like going yeah. hard. You know, like, so that's not going to happen. So I just gave up on all of it. You know, I just gave, I started, uh, I started kind of thinking of ways to make myself my own boss, you know, so I don't go on TV every day. And it was weird because I never thought of myself as someone who would like become addicted to the attention. Huh? But when I was going from CNN to do the, you know, the like talk in the box commentator shows, and I was doing that five days a week wow. and then driving across town to do access Hollywood and then wow. doing radio. And I, even though I didn't, I really did, especially the CNN stuff yeah. at that era, because now, like I said, we're talking 2017. Yeah. 2000, where it didn't, there was nothing I could say where people wouldn't yell at me. Man. Like it genuinely, everything <sighs> I said, there would just be like, and the more I yelled at people or people yelled at me, the bigger boner the producers got. And I'm like, well, why can't we be adults here? Like, well, no, no, that, that was great. I mean, one, I'll never forget one situation where I really knew I was going to have real problem. I was doing a midday live show in the same studio that, um, Pierce Morgan did his show. Okay. And it was, uh -huh. uh, and there's like me, Dr. Drew, uh, this, um, black lives matter representative and some other person. Uh -huh. And we're all on the panel. Yeah. And we're, we're in those boxes where it looks like we're in different and we're, 40, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're like 40 feet away. From yeah. 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 <laughs> and this lady goes, uh, and they were showing a video of police. Mm. Uh, taking down a, a guy who was walking the streets of San Francisco with like a machete. He was like Ooh. clearly like a danger to yeah, society. Yeah, that's kind of an issue. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. He was also very clearly mentally ill, but he was he, he was walking through traffic with a machete. Yeah. So police, uh, naturally, they surround him and the guy won't put the machete. So they tackle him and they yeah. handcuff him. No, the guy wasn't in a hurry. Right? And this lady goes, this is just another example of white supremacy. <laughs> And uh, it was like, a, you know, like a live audience. And they're like, you know, like, oh, yeah. I was like, well, wait, okay, <laughs> let's pump your brakes here. Like, because they, I think one of those cops was black, <laughs> A. And B, uh, how, like, that guy was a real threat, regardless of his skin tone, he was a real threat to society. They had to do something and yeah. they didn't hurt him. But I think, I don't know how this creates to, uh, correlates to white supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, that's because you can't see it because you're, you're, you have you deal with your uh the luxury of being a white man you, 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 you I <laughs> so I just, uh, yeah I, i'm very white so i just explode oh veins coming out of my neck no. i was like the, the, the hundreds of years of real discrimination that you and your ancestors have to deal with and you're gonna come on here for attention and pats on the back and call this white supremacy <laughs> it's a, and those poor police officers they're just trying to do their job you're just you're a disgrace where do you write for oh yeah total bullshit.com i forgot you'll never work it and i'm screaming Holy right okay. shit dude veins coming out like i said and i i <laughs> we go to break <laughs> And I'm like, oh, oh shit. I'm I'm never I'm gonna be fired. Yep. I just had a baby. Oh. I'm, my life's over. I walk out of the studio. There's the a producer and one of the assistant directors at NBC Universal, like a big wig. Yeah. And they're like, Yeah. <laughs> All right. That is gonna be huge. I bet you that test through the roof. And I was like, oh. 
you want that? They're like, yeah, we want that. Oh, my God. I, and I was like, oh, well, this, because I can't do that. If you pay me $70 million, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the money, which was great. I, I can't go and be angry at people all day. Yeah. Because life's too short. To, Hell yeah. I was like, this is the, and, and, and so it makes me, I, I now don't wonder why, and this is not a partisan statement. It could be Tucker Carlson. It could be Rachel Maddow. I don't wonder why they do what they do. Where you're like, well, why are, hmm. why are you why are you digging your heels in so hard on that mm-hmm. one? It's a pretty nuanced yeah. situation here. Uh, yeah. Why are you good with it? Because they get paid a lot of money and they have to sell advertisement. Yeah. That's all it is. It's yeah. not It's not about informing yeah. people. It's not about having nuanced ideas. They have to sell advertising and that shit gets ratings. Yeah. And there's no one else to blame but us, the public. Yeah, I couldn't because agree with you more. We're entertained. We're entertained. Yeah. You don't, and people would so not watch a news show where they're like, uh, let's take a balanced view of this <laughs> and really step back and understand uh, none of us in the studio has ever been in combat. Uh, so let's talk to a military specialist <laughs> Who have <laughs> differing views and maybe get a really well balanced and completely uh, That's yeah. crazy talk you got going on there, Mike. Yeah. That's really crazy. <laughs> Instead of having Mike Catherwood comment on this police interaction with a black light, let's uh <laughs> how about talk to someone who works in law enforcement? Oh man. Oh, so so that was it. That was it for you in a sense. You were like, I can't I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I I really I I from there was a there was a piece of it that was like integrity where I was like, you know what, I want to do stuff that makes yeah. me grow. But I'll be very honest with you. There's another part of it that was like I it was a lot easier because my wife's a very successful actress. Nice. So it's not as if I was just like, screw you, yeah. mainstream Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, I'll, I'll figure stuff, it out. Yeah. yeah. So um that's a good question. How did you meet your wife? She was on my radio show. She was on a CBS show at the time called Rules of Engagement with oh. David Spade. Yeah, yeah, I remember that was one. On for a long time. And she came to promote that show on Loveline. And she sat down like you're sitting across yeah. from me right now and yeah. clearly was overwhelmed by my magnetism. Man, I'm overwhelmed by it too, Mike. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> That's this. awesome. Yeah. So you guys met on the job, basically. We did. She was at work too. A lot of people yeah. forget that. You yeah, know, she like was she, marketing the show. Probably. And um, I did not get it. Like, I did not get what? Like, that she was in. I Oh, it was oh. Like, like eight, nine months went by what? before we went out on a date when she came over. She was sitting in the show uh, in that chair going, oh, this guy's so my type. And yeah, yeah. Really, I'm like, this is the fourth hot chick that's come <laughs> on this week. No offense, but like, I just. Yeah. I never in a million years would assume that they come in and do the show. Like I said, they're working. Yeah. Uh, they probably are like, yeah, that was an enjoyable experience. Let me go. Yeah. Move I got my, my next one. I didn't assume that that was part of this. So how, exchange. so eight months go by. What did she send you? Like, did she smack you with a rock or something? She started like hounding me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Was, was it like, Hey, dumbass, like what's your number or something? <laughs> Finally at the, <laughs> towards the end, because like, she sent these like subtle hints. And as you can see, I'm not oh, yeah. picking up this on that. Whoop, right over. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. Nice. That's funny. <laughs> and, and I, or I wouldn't respond at all. You know? <laughs> and finally, she I think she DM me and she's like, what do we, what do we have to do to get you to. <laughs> what? The- <laughs> so like, and you see, and did it like the, like all of a sudden it all made sense. Like all those little subtle clues, all those messages, all those uh, text, me- or, no. uh, Twitters and uh, tweets. And- no, no I didn't think about it. No. So even when she, there's I was like, there probably like in a nine month span, who knows? That was, that was when I was single. Like, oh yeah. It's a nine month span. There's like 400 other chicks. Even. Oh. I wasn't even thinking about it. That's hilarious. So that's nice that, that, uh, I guess there was a, uh, a, a very unique kind of, um, beginning for you guys. Cause you guys, mm-hmm. you, um, you played hard to get and apparently yeah. it worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't recommend playing hard to get, but I would. <laughs> What I would recommend was be is be so stupid that you there, there's no there was never a threat of me looking desperate there because I would just be I would walk in the room and see a girl that I found really attractive and behave the exact same way as I would walk in the room with you two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I love. It's so awesome. You're just you're so genuine in that sense. Either either that or I just didn't understand. I mean, maybe look. Maybe there was a reason why I was so successful with girls, mm. uh, at least after I sobered up, was that I, there was no, I mean, 
I also never, even when I had the money, I never like bought a sports car. Or, like, yeah. You know, I, 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 there was always this really, I, I, you know what? It, I'm certainly not in a, in a comprehensive way, like oh, the most moral guy or the most, but what I did, what I do think, uh, and I really stand behind this is like disingenuous stuff would mm. really rub me the wrong way. Mm. And I think there was, um, Something about growing up in LA, I think, really hit me with like the idea of pretension or or being disingenuous or unauth- inauthentic. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I would grow up half the time around these just regular people, yeah, and I would have fun. And then I would see as I got a little older, you get introduced to like this person's an actor, this person works at a studio, this guy's yeah. you know, plays bass for fill in the blank band, yeah. And they were all like pretend like they were too cool at wherever they were. Mm-hmm. There was somewhere else that was cooler. Yeah. And wherever they were doing, they didn't want to act like everyone else because they were above that. Yes. Like they didn't stream at the concerts and they didn't jump up and down at the Laker game because they were indoors with their sunglasses on. And like that, that shit drove me crazy. Yes. So even when it came down to like talking to girls, I, I just never saw why some of my, either my friends or especially at Loveline, younger guys would call and they're like, what do I, do? I was like, go talk to her. Yeah. You know how you go talk to someone that you meet? At, mm. you, 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 what do you do? What do you, what do you went mm. to? I'm into yoga. Okay. You know, how you, like a, there's a guy, you're a straight guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, there'd be a guy next to you and he has a, a yoga mat that you like and you go, Hey, where'd you get that yoga mat? Do that. <laughs> do that with, but, but do, do it, it with the girls. girls. Yes. And don't pretend to be something. And, uh. I, I, I just gave up on the idea of like, I, I certainly like style and stuff and like people when they have a stuff, but I, I gave up on like reading GQ or oh, yeah. giving a crap about like, what's the cooler music. Yeah. And, um, I would wear my sleeveless layer shirt and my five Oh ones to hang out with my buddies. So yeah. why wouldn't I do that to go to well, this yeah. super hot Supreme chick? Place, yeah. You know? And, um, and it just ended up seeing because that, that, and that, that carried over. And that's the only thing I could think about. Like when I could, the one thing I've learned about life yeah. is it, it not even whether it be entertainment industry, another industry, dealing with your family, dealing with people is that authenticity gets you farther than anything else. hundred percent. Even if you're an, asshole you're authentically an asshole yes it works i'm telling you i mean i've seen the same thing i mean you know in today's day and age with social media and you know person you know the um influencers Mm -hmm. so many of them will do better when they just are themselves rather than rather than try to be something that they're not when they are themselves People recognize that there is a everybody has a bullshit meter. Everybody has a way of kind of like filtering out a lot of that stuff. And I see the folks that are successful are guys that are just being themselves and people accept that and they accept them and they enjoy that because there's no there's no pretentiousness. It's just let me, let me give you an example. Please do a very great like a very clear one. Oh, maybe. Ellen DeGeneres. Yes. Had her entire career dismantled. Yeah. Because people let out the bag that she might not be very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. She never assaulted anyone. Yeah. She never put anybody in any peculiar sexual situations. Yeah, yeah. She never flexed her power. She just was kind of bitchy to people yeah, yeah, yeah. every once in a while. And that got out. And now things are over for her. Yeah. Why? Because Ellen's whole thing was I'm everybody's best friend. Yeah. And if you watched her show during the daytime, yeah. you looked at that TV yeah. and you got the sense that like, I could dance with you, Ellen. Yeah. You care. And yeah. Like, it was all facade. <laughs> David Letterman, yeah. married man David Letterman in his like 60s <laughs> got caught banging his 20 something year old intern. Oh, wow. First of all, good. Red handed. Yeah. Red handed, yeah. right? David Letterman goes on TV and goes, uh, yeah, so this is not good. Uh, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, now I apologize. I shouldn't do this to that young girl and to my wife. And, uh, uh, anyway, Pam Anderson on the show tonight. And, uh, <laughs> We got uh, Silver Sun pickups. For, <laughs> and everyone, everyone was just like, it didn't happen. Yeah. Why? David Letterman never made any claims to be anything but a curmudgeon yeah, yeah. who doesn't sure. want to hang out with you. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. doesn't even like the people who pay his bills. Yeah, it's so it's true. So, this business network sucks. I, I don't want to talk. Don't come in my office. Yeah. After that, when I'm done and I walk back into my dressing room, don't knock. Don't come in. I'm going to go home. Yeah. I'm going to watch Leave some me alone. baseball. Oh, my God. God, I love him for that. I love him for that, though. That was the thing, you know, I 
I thought that's one of the things that separated him so much was that he like he was every you know, you could tell when you watched him that. Yeah, that's that's how he is in in real life. Um, All right. So. So we've we got your we found out that you are a little dense when it came to your wife. It took you some time, but you came around and, you know, looking back kind of like over the success, the trials and tribulations. Did you like, is there something that you wish you could have done differently or changed or is there a regret? I have some, I have some. As Frank Sinatra says, regrets. Yes. I have a few. I have a few. <laughs> um, none, none so profound that I can't sleep at night, which is, I'm really lucky because mm-hmm. of how much drinking and drug using I did. Um, it could have, I could have very easily had that car accident or without a doubt like like even just even just emotionally shattering someone by saying something that i didn't remember saying yeah i don't have any of those luckily but i really regret that in the time of my life when i would have i was so useless that i couldn't i never joined the military Uh, because uh i would have been a good soldier i really sure of it yeah i believe in the cause yeah uh I kind of like the idea of pecking orders, yeah. of chain of command, yeah, and earning the ability to kind of ascend that. Mm-hmm. Um, I like physically challenging myself. Mm. I feel like there's a lot of carryover to my development as a human. Um, so there, all, the, but uh, I couldn't even tie my shoes when I was <laughs> 21. You know, like so <laughs> that. Um, but I, as much as that is a sincere regret. Uh, I also look back on it and it's like, I wouldn't have the life I have yeah. if that was the route I took. So who true. knows? Because, you know, maybe that would have only exacerbated my, my mental health struggles or my, my drug use. Who knows? Who it's knows? true. You know, so I, I can't look back on it with too much regret, but that is absolutely a legitimate regret. One time when I was really first ass- tra- transferring into television from radio, I was, uh, I would host, um, I would fill in for Regis you know, oh, before yeah. our rest in peace. Yeah. Um, and I would, they would fly me out to New York pretty frequently to wow. when Regis, you know, cause he was getting older and he yeah. would take more time off than Kelly would. Yeah. And I would sit in for Regis and uh, sometimes it'd be like two or three shows in a row. Sometimes just one show. Here yeah. and, there. and one time um, I went out there and it, it, I had done it pretty frequently. And Kelly was always, she's such a good broadcaster, but also she would, it's always really nice to me. And she had would play up like, you're so handsome. Like, <laughs> I bet you, I bet you like, what's the life with the romance, yeah. you know? And I, after that, right after I had been on Dancing with the Stars, she, which is also an ABC show like, like them, uh-huh. they would pl- talk that up a lot. Like, oh, nice. I bet you he's like yeah. dating all yeah, the girls. Yeah, yeah. But I had, I had a, a girlfriend yeah. at home. Okay. And uh, I went on this one time and Kelly asks me, she's like, so what's with your dating life? Yeah. And not because I wanted to cheat on her and make myself, but be, I, I felt like this push for like a, for professional reasons. Huh. Like if I made myself sing, seem single, it would make more chicks yeah. or gay dudes yeah. want to f- watch me. Yeah. You're, you're still on the moment. market. There's yeah. still a chance. And that's a live show, you know, mm. and I'm you know, just a good Four to 10 million people you know, every day. Oh, yeah. And so I, she oh. asked me, and I go, oh, no, I yeah, no one special in my life. I'm totally single. Yeah. And my girlfriend's back in LA watching it. Oh, yeah. And I, and I explained this to her. Yeah. I was like, yeah. had nothing to do. I'm not trying. Uh, the career yeah, move. It was, I was like, totally. And, and, uh, and she's like, okay. I mean, I, I understand. But now, years later, this is 2010 or something, yeah. 2009. Um, I so regret doing that because yeah. I was like, how did she, f- that moment she's watched it and they're watching live oh, television. Gosh, yeah. She must've felt like fucking bomb hitter, you know, I felt <sighs> really bad. well, the fact, you know, I mean, that's, that's good that you can look back at that and recognize the hurt in a sense that yeah. you probably caused. Obviously it wasn't intentional, but a lot of hurt is not intentional. We just don't think things through most of the time. And I, I can appreciate that at that moment, you know, your interest was in your professional career and what can you do? I mean, uh, honestly, you know, it's also one of those things where 
you know, like being in that spotlight, the privacy, like that's tough. Like trying to stay, trying to keep a little bit of yourself private is hard. Yeah. You know, like I can't even imagine four to 10 million people knowing about your love life. You know, that's it's true, but you can, you can also be fully transparent, but then the things that matter, mm. I think everyone understands. I mean, I, I think it dives into the authenticity stuff too. Mm. Uh, no one would have any problem if uh, I didn't talk about my daughter mm. or, or my children, yep. you know, pe- yep. and I think celebrities, a lot of like their invasion of privacy is very legitimate. I remember one time I was at the, in, um, in wintertime in Santa Monica, they make fake snow yeah, because it doesn't snow. Enough. Yeah. And they do a skating ring. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I was there. This is like four or five years ago. Right. And I was there with my family and I took my daughter to go ice skating. And we're out there. I'm I, terrible. And I'm out there with my daughter like this. And Ben Affleck shows up. Ben Affleck with Jennifer Garner at the time. They were still married. Yeah. And the, her, her kids. Ben Affleck walks out on the ice with his kids. And it's like Darth Vader. Because he's a big enough celebrity. Like an A-lister. Like yeah. People are like, oh, yeah. Shit. yeah. Ben Affleck's um, skating around. One of his kids, uh, probably, I'm guessing my memory serves me correctly. It was probably around five or six. Okay. Eat shit hard. Ooh. Like, boom, on the hard ice. You know? Ooh. And understandably he's like oh whoa baby you're okay and he gets down on one knee on his gate and uh he's trying to help his child and in that moment like 20 people start closing in with their cell phones <sighs> and i'm like oh dude like i know that people are cool. tired of celebrities bitching and moaning about their but like that's like that's his life yeah i was like man you know i got that one that one instance really gave me like a sense of like oh man he, these people are really tortured by this but but at the same time, Jeff Bridges was on the radio show one time. And I go, how do you have a 45, 50 year career without ever being in the tabloids? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> he goes, I just go where they're not. Smart man. And, and he, uh, so I think there, <laughs> in, in one way, I think Jeff, Jeff Bridges definitely had a lot of his career when they didn't have smartphones and TMZ. So true, man. But Jeff Bridges brings up a good point is that you make, you make the decision to be a public figure whether it be politics, whether it be athlete, whether it be uh, celebrity. celebrity, you uh, have to understand that some of that stuff is going to be compromised. But at the same time, if you are willing, yeah. if you really wanted to, yeah. you could keep Still a lot of stuff here. yourself. And your you privacy. Know? Oh, that makes sense too. Man, I love that guy. I love his movies. Um, so if you, like one of the things that I like to talk about as well is like, we, we, we talked about regrets and mistakes are kind of like in that, uh, kind of category regrets, like a mistake that you make the, um, the next question is kind of like, was there a mentor in your life as you were moving up the chain, if you will, that kind of gave you some solid advice that you took to heart and made a difference? Yeah, there, I, I never had like a, like an ongoing mentor, mm. but people would come into my life and were really nice. They were, they were really thoughtful and considerate in a way that like had a long lasting effect on hmm. me. And they weren't necessarily people that I knew all that well. Some, some were, some weren't. Mm. Um, I was talking about it earlier when we were on, uh, on the mats in jujitsu that I, before I moved to Texas, I trained at Crone Gracie's Academy. Oh, nice. And Crone was awesome. And he was a really positive influence in my life in many ways. Yeah. But when Crone was preparing for his UFC fights, he would be gone a lot. Yeah. Understandably. So Hickson would come in and train. <laughs> and I, being a guy with weird, wacky, erratic schedule, would normally train at the lunch class, you know, 11 or 12 in the afternoon. Yeah. There'd be like two people there. Yeah, yeah. And Hickson's there. T- coaching. Wow. So I had the, like a really weird, amazing experience of having Hickson Gracie give me nuggets of knowledge that i that keep with me for the yeah. rest of my life you know what's give me one give me one give me i remember one. one time like it was like just like i said it was like me and like three other people and he was talking about elevating his hips from close guard to, yeah. to like lock up and he's like you do triangle yeah. you do arm bar from there <laughs> and um this one guy said uh you know i I'm, he was short he was short and jacked yeah it was, it was like yeah. short short though yeah. like five Four. Oh wow! Like a, like uh, he looked. Um, 
he looked like a uh, like odd job. He was an Asian guy, and he was, and he was Jack. He was <laughs> I like, know, I got a picture. Perfect. If, if you were doing judo with this guy, you were fucked because yeah. he was so low to the ground. He was so strong. He was yeah. Jack, but he 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 was not gonna like have this elaborate guard play. Yeah. And he said, Hickson, uh, do you mind me, I'm Professor? I I don't think I can do that physically. I don't think I can get. It. And Hickson said, Don't do that. My jujitsu is not your jujitsu. <laughs> You figure out a way to make it work for you, my friend. If you don't to play four guards, it's fine. But you're short, so you you short, you're strong. You play top game, is strong, you know. Yeah. And and then he said, and, and he kind of like broke into um, that about like he said, all all matters is you control the space. It doesn't matter how you play your game. Is you have to have the basic simple idea. Then you do these things. It doesn't matter how you do it. It's just basic simple thing. He's the same as in life. He's like, I can do these things that you do. Yeah, yeah. You go, you go out, it's crawl and grow out on the skateboard, do flips and tricks. I can't do that. <laughs> you let him do that. I'm not going to do yeah. that. I go surfing. It's fine for me. Yeah. So that is the way life is. My jujitsu is not your jujitsu. First of all, that's a really good impersonation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's really good. Uh, and that's awesome. That's a great one too. You know, something that we talked about before we started uh, the show um, was how I saw the you know the the subject of vikings and pirates the same yeah but how you don't totally different totally different yeah. why is that that's like saying i see uh i see um bank robbers and cops the same they both wear dark outfits and they both carry guns and they shoot you know. oh, man mike i'm gonna because to- they go on boats they're the same they You're do the high. same thing they 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 no they pillage they 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 go in and they no. they plunder vikings <laughs> had world changing nautical <laughs> development for sure that's the that allowed pirates, them to raid. pirates steal <laughs> shit well, the- and get scurvy <laughs> they go to places this is this is the real difference vikings go wherever they want yes and then fuck people up when they get there that's true pirates go wherever there's weak people so that they can take advantage of them and hopefully get out of there before the Spaniards come or the British army or whatever. That's a good correlation. I still feel as though there are similarities. I still feel that there is they a float. <laughs> That's the similarity. My daughter just bought a little teeny boat with a sail. She puts it on her. She puts it on her. Sorry. She puts uh. it on her uh, bathtub. And yeah. it flo- is that the same as the USS uh, Eisenhower? <laughs> Maybe not, but still, you know, there's still the uh, the the pillaging and plundering that they both share. But fine, if you have a different, we can agree to disagree. Maybe below may, the only people I can think of it would be Mongols. Yeah, that's the only people above Vikings yeah. as far as just straight serving. Yeah, yeah, because the Vikings, wherever that ship went, yeah, you were on the losing end. Yeah, pretty much. They didn't care if yeah. you had your own yeah. armada. Yeah, they didn't care if you knew how to fight. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't care if it was all men. They didn't care if it was all. Yeah. they were you. They land. You're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pirates is like. Let better make sure there's nothing but old ladies there <laughs> because I'm just a thief. Uh, well, fine. I see your point. I still think that they they're... blew their horn before they even got into shore. <laughs> <laughs> Letting you raiding do it. party. Get ready. Raiding party coming ashore. Yes. Yes. That I. I so the reason why I kind of. Uh, had such good time with this subject is because uh, my son and I are watching the series Vikings. You know, yes. we finally are like on the sixth series, the sixth episode or sixth season. Good Lord. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's been a great season or a great um, series to watch. I've really enjoyed it. And we like in the between, we'll stop and we'll look it up. We'll go do some historical data, dump, you know, data crunching and stuff like that. I'm like, holy shit, man, these guys did exist like this guy did. And he did this. And oh my God, this is really cool. So I really appreciated the authenticity and the, fairly accurate depiction obviously i know there's still some some hollywood ism in that but uh, i really enjoyed it so that's you're why a navy I, man right so yeah. you, you understand yeah. nautical stuff yeah of yeah, course yeah. i do that's why i was saying like i feel like they're kind of the same but yeah. you do make a point in how they approach their their raiding and plundering like I, i'll give you that all right i like this question because i get so many different responses and the question is how do you deal with failure well, um, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. um, I think that 
I deal with failure better now than I ever have before in my life because I never, no matter how many times I heard it from a, from a Jocko or a Tim Kennedy mm-hmm. or, or David, yeah, I know. you know, those types of yeah. folks, no matter how much I, I would ha- had heard that failure is an, an integral part of success. Yeah. I never, I never got it. Yeah. You know, I never yeah. let that sink in. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was the guy who would drive home from jujitsu as a blue belt furious because a, a brown belt and two black belts tapped me out 50 times a piece. <laughs> but I was furious. Like, I'm such a bad yeah. jujitsu player. Yeah. I'm so crappy. Yeah. Yeah. And once I realized, like, that's part of the that's part of life. That's yeah. part of the game. That's part of life. Yeah. Whether it's Louis C.K., George Carlin, whoever in the game of comedy, he's a, you know, bombing Bumping is essential and you can't be good at this job until you learn to embrace the idea of bombing. Yeah. Because you could be the best comic in the world yeah. and every night you're not going to step on stage and please that audience. Yeah. It's 50 to 500 different people with different sensibilities at different times in their life. This lady yeah. could be uh, just gave birth yeah. or uh, uh, having that time yeah. of the month. This guy just got fired. Yeah. You know, you never know the That's vibe true. in the room. It could be raining and slushy outside. People are just angry. Yeah. Every there's, you can't have this be married to the idea of always being successful. It's true. And, um, you know, I just look at failure. I always try to look at failure with two things. One, if I fail, it means at least I tried. Good point. And so many people who are so sad, especially in this country, I feel like they're just not, they're not even giving it a shot. I hear you. You know? 100%. And a lot of the my friends who are either podcasters or or comics or actors they, they get they, they there's a whole culture of people who just sit at home talking shit about them. Yeah. And I was like, "Man, but at least they're they at least they did it." Yeah. You may not like I may not like this band, I may not like this comic. I was like, "You know what? Who cares?" Yeah. At least they're doing it. Absolutely. They're doing the damn thing. So, if I fail, it means at least I tried. Yeah. And secondly, I don't really learn anything when I win. <laughs> I don't really. I don't. There's some truth in that. I never really learned anything about myself from 2003 to 2008 because I just got this job where people paid me to be silly yeah. and goofy. Yeah. And I got more and more popular. Yeah. And I ascended the ranks in radio and then I got my own radio, you know, and I didn't really learn a lot about myself. Interesting. And then I learned a lot about myself when I started trying to put together my own ideas and say, or I try to do certain things and it didn't really work out. Yeah. 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 I, I, I had, um, a fear of failing because I didn't want to look bad. I didn't want to look bad in front of my, my peers, my teammates. Yeah. And that was, <clears throat> I look back at that and that, that, you know, if I had, re- I have plenty of regrets, but that one is a big one. You know, I was, but did you, cause I think there's a, a big difference. Okay. Did you not want to look bad in front of them or did you not want to let them down? So there's that's a big a, difference. Absolutely. hundred percent. I, I didn't want to look bad. Okay. That, that was it a hundred percent. And, and I was talented and gifted and I was good. So I didn't like, I didn't want to, I just, I, I can recall at times that I didn't want to look bad in front of them. I didn't mind looking bad in front of other people, but I didn't want to look bad in front of them. And so consequently what would happen is I would not push the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like I would know if I go a little bit fast, if I run a little bit harder, if I, if I do these things, I potentially could fail. Mm -hmm. Like I, I could see where that failure point is and I would just pull back from it instead of trying to, explore okay well what happens if i fail okay i mean these guys know how good i am they're not going to like think i can't do the job they're just going to say okay hey tone it down a little bit bring it in but i i that's one thing that i kind of do regret is like i was afraid to fail as opposed to really pushing the boundaries and once i did push the boundaries and fail man i would fail often well yeah and and i think not to get too heady but you know nietzsche was saying this 250 years ago yeah was that people it's not that people are lazy. It's not that people are not talented. It's that people are so scared to break away from the kind of normalcy of mediocrity. Yeah. Because they don't want to look bad for their neighbor. It's a hundred percent. I I, you know? I fit that to a T. And when I finally did break out of that, um, 
It made such a difference. It really did. It it came a little bit late, too late in my career. It's it's unfortunate because you know if I had embraced that failure aspect a lot sooner, um, you know who knows what could have happened. But I'm fortunate enough now that I can draw on it now and take advantage of the failures yeah. and learn from my failures. I like what you said. Like I don't learn anything from winning, other than well, just keep doing whatever that was. But I don't know what that was because I don't know exactly what caused me to win. Here, in my current state, I I learn. A lot more from failures than I do from from the wins. So yeah. I'm I'm more into that. So that's that's good to hear. I like how you had the the one thing too that you said that I think is very important is that at least I tried. That's I mean, I, I just think that's the one thing I worry about more about people are so upset about like the internet and smartphones and um the the erosion of traditional moral values and all these things because of the next generation. Mm. I'm not saying there's no val- there's no validity though. Yeah, but none of that worries me as much as the increasing kind of the increasing ethic of we'll just don't try. Mm-hmm. Timidness. The idea of like, well, if you don't subject yourself to it at all then they won't make fun of you yeah, it's true because kids are growing up nowadays and it's not even their fault kids are growing up nowadays with trolls yeah from day one it's crazy every kid had to deal with some level of bullying and i i genuinely feel sorry about that but it ended when you left school yeah now it's just it never ends and there's trolls and there's kids who are and and so i think like people are getting and then also technology has made life so easy that I think there's almost in a really distorted way people are um think that there's merit in just in just playing it safe in every yeah, regard. It's true. And if you look at I mean think about every every generation of ours in this country before us. Think about how preposterous it was for men to get in a rocket and go to the moon (laughs) and then get in another rocket while up there and go down to the moon and then get back when like 25 dudes had died in in preparation for this. And all science, all scientists, all the astrophysicists, everyone got together and they're like, we've run the tests. We've done the simulations. We've done the algorithms. And there's very little chance this is going to work. Yeah. And they're like, let's do it. Let's go. Got to do it. Frontier Challenge Nation. accepted. And and <laughs> I certainly saw the kind of the downside of what the Cold War was doing yeah. to people yeah. because it, uh, the added level of stress and 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 sure, you know, there was a reason why they call it cold because there wasn't bloodshed and yeah. things of that nature. But it put people. There was a lot of suffering that happened from it. I but agree. Can't deny there's a lot of good too. Yeah, because people's ass was to the fire. Yeah. All the time, yeah. On this side of the country, on this side of the globe, and on the other, Agreed. people were pushing themselves, and it's true. I mean, that was one of the things that I was like. When you look back, and I'm glad you branch, you mentioned that because the uh, the space race, watching mm-hmm. the space race, and if ever there was a lofty goal, going to space was definitely one of them. And like you said, there were so many failures leading up to it, and terrible, tragic, tragic failures as well. But all the little failures in between. And the fact that they take those failures and they learn from them and they take them and they change what they're doing to prevent it from happening, hopefully, and at least making it get in one more one more level, one more step up to yeah. the next problem, next failure. And 100 years before that, you know, mid mid 19th century, you're a family in <clears throat> Michigan mm. and you're like, it's getting too cold here. There's no work. We got to move west. Yeah. Uh, son, daughter. So, uh, other son, wife, we're not all making it. Yeah. Let's just be very clear. <laughs> Chances are most of us aren't going to make it. Yeah. I'll be shocked if any of yeah. us make it to Oregon yeah, yeah. or California. Yeah. But we got to do this. Yeah. And we got to do it for the sake of the, uh, for the next year. And you're like, okay. Like, all right. Like, the, Dad, please like, don't eat me. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, all right. Thinking son, about yeah. how, how rough that was moving, like going west, as the saying says. And like people don't realize how much death was involved in just trying to go west, how much how many failures occurred in trying to get there. I mean, between the elements, between the adversity that you faced with other people that didn't want you to go west, all of that. It's a and and that that worries me. And I I think that because like troll culture has gotten so um, 
so strong. Yeah. So pervasive. A troll culture. I, I worry that people are just going to do it because, man, like you really shouldn't be clowning the person who gives it a go. Yeah. And maybe it doesn't work out. Yeah. May, you may, okay. This guy's Dude, totally. This actor tried music and you don't like their music. Fine. Okay. But I'd much like the person who just should have, would have, could have their whole life. That's that's, that's where a sad I, life. Yeah, that's where I really I worry because uh Lord knows I I I've failed a lot, but um after I get through the like the initial mm. fallout of of just feeling horrible mm-hmm. because you're, you yeah. feel if your ego takes it uh the a damage. Little bit of a hit. Yeah, you know, then you feel ridiculed, you feel rejected. Yeah. But I was like, you know what, at least I tried. At least, I, at least yeah. I fucking uh, because there was that moment before I did this yeah. where I was like, "This could go really bad, and this is gonna be horrible, right?" And I'm scared. Yeah, but at least I <laughs> still did it. Yeah. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> All right, so let's start wrapping things up with mm. a final question. Yeah, what do you? What is the biggest takeaway you want our listeners? What What do you want our listeners to take away from this? The biggest, if I could impart any information to anyone i always walk on that with thin ice because i certainly don't have everything figured out yeah for sure i struggle a lot you know i'm still searching in many ways but i think i would say with the imagery that is forced in our eyeballs all day every day yeah with the advent of technology and i look at my life as someone who i'm I'm in a weird position in that i live half of my life without the internet and the other half with it. Wow. So I have perspective. Yeah. Kids who were born in 1997 don't understand. That's so true. That I graduated high school in 1997. I lived my whole life thinking that I had to go to an encyclopedia. Yeah. Until <laughs> then I was in my mid twenties and I was like, Oh, I can Google it. Yeah. You know? So, and, uh, I lived the first half of my life where you had to be a professional model or an A-list actor. To have someone take a picture of you and then have strangers critique that picture. Now, that's every person on planet Earth. That's so true. And I would like to say that don't allow yourself to construct your identity by an amalgamation of all these different things that you see in here. Yes. Because there's no escaping all these different things that you see in here. Yeah. Because most of the stuff that you see in here. Is just a way for other people to make money. Yeah. Has nothing to do with trying to increase yeah. the ability for you to construct it. Because there has to be some type of internal fuel building that identity. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Really understanding who you are and building that identity. But don't do it by cutting and pasting yeah. these thousands and thousands of different things that you see in here. Well, that kind of ties in with what you were talking about earlier about being, you know, being authentic and, mm-hmm. and, and being who you were, finding the way to be creative. You found that through your, you know, your very first opportunity there and they, they encouraged it and it got, you know, it basically just fed you the necessary fuel to kind of be you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the key. It's like, I feel like if more people just Ex, you know, and I'm not saying you have to like yourself, but just to accept who you are and then work from there. If you need work in areas, find ways to fix that stuff. Yeah. Don't don't try it. Like I, I, I've got plenty of areas that need improvement and I try to tackle one or two every now and then. But, you know, the the one thing that I always try to do is just be the same person that I've always been and not try to be so influenced by outside factors. Yeah, that's that's. Who amongst us hasn't been influenced by what we think people will think? Exactly. Right. But it's, 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 it's silly. It's something that children do, but yet almost all adults allow it to sneak back into our life. Yeah. Where we take into consideration. Oh, okay. Here's another piece from a really smart person. Okay. Ricky Gervais was on the show. Oh, (laughs) he's a hood man. Yeah. And another (laughs) thing, but guys, authentic, he's, very sarcastic. He doesn't, yes. he's not very friendly. Yes. You know? But we were off the air and I said, you know, as a guy, Mr. Ray said, if you don't mind me asking, I said, you know, the guy want to be creative for a living. Yeah. I want to come up with stuff. They make people laugh, make people think that's what I want to do. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how, but I want to be a creative. Do you have any advice for me? 
And he said, as soon as you start creating something that you think the audience wants, you're sunk. Huh. You create what you want. Nice. I write jokes that I think are funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do radio that you think is compelling. Write that song that you think is beautiful. Yeah. Because as soon as you start taking into consideration who the people are on the receiving end and what they might want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's marketable, what's appealing, what's a hip and cool current. Yeah. You're sunk. Yeah. You do what you think. And the same, look, it could be as something as serious as that, but it's also the same thing as like the type of car you buy, the type of clothes you wear, the te- none of that matters what anyone else thinks about it. And in the end, no one gives, no one truly cares, true. but we have this idea that people do, yeah. man. And when I was in high school, I was, I was really into metal, you know, like really into, it. I would go and save my money to go to back then. There was no internet. You go to the record store to buy the tickets and you'd sleep out yeah. overnight to get. And, you know, in 1995, you couldn't wear, you couldn't wear uh, uh, no effect shirt to a Pantera show. You would get your ass kicked <laughs> and you couldn't wear a Pantera shirt to a Pennywise show because yeah. you would get your ass kicked. Yeah. Punk rock guys did not like metal guys and metal guys did not like boy. And 10 years later, everyone just kind of let, they were like, wait, no, I really like Pennywise. Yeah, yeah I know I like Pantera, but yeah. I really like yeah, Pennywise. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, I, I know I really like pop. I like Blink-182 and I like Goldfinger, but there's some there's some Slayer songs that are that are oh, hell awesome, yeah. you know, yeah. and everybody, because it's fucking silly to give a shit. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, no, I really do like this. Yeah, I really do yeah. like and I don't need to stay within categories. I just did a big rant on it on my podcast. It's like people do it with food now. Oh, so true. I'm carnivore. No, I, I I'm keto. I'm I'm plant based. I was like, how I. I what do you eat, Mike? You look good. I go, I eat food. Yeah. I eat whatever I, I regulate get my hands. the amount of it. Yeah. I try to up my protein. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, yeah. apple. I, I'll eat an apple and a steak. Yeah. Sh- I know. Shocker. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people learn more about you and all the new projects that you've got going on? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I would say <laughs> at, at Mike Catherwood on Instagram is probably the best place to go. My, Twitter, my Twitter got hacked like. Six months ago, and I never got it fixed. And oh, shit. So I don't know what's going on with that. Oh. I'm probably saying. Well, thank God you already met your wife through there, and you're done with that. Yeah. No, but I'm just really worried that whoever hacked me is going to, like, say some cancelable stuff. Oh. But I've gotten it out there that it's like, this isn't me. Yeah. For, for like, eight, almost eight months, it's not me. So. What the fuck? That's crazy. Yeah. Well, let me just see if I can dial up Eon right now and just get him. Did you get him on the phone? <laughs> I know he's local. <laughs> That's true. All right, folks. Well, that's a wrap. Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I had such a great time. Me too, man. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yes. I want to thank the audience for tuning in. Thank our sponsors. I want to thank the men and women that are holding the line. You can check out all our previous podcasts by visiting thebulletproofworkshop.com. Learn more about me and training opportunities by visiting trainingconcepts.com. Until then, I'm Jeff Gonzalez. You're listening to The Bulletproof Workshop. Stay safe or be dangerous.